Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, joined by Chairman of the China Select Committee, Select Committee on Engagement with the Chinese Communist Party, Mike Gallagher, Congressman from Wisconsin. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, let's begin with your reaction. The death toll in Israel is up to 1,200 uh, victims murdered by bloodthirsty terrorists. I, I really, this glimpse into the depth of evil in Gaza is quite disturbing. I don't know how many monsters they've produced, but they've got a factory of them. Yeah, I think it is appropriate to frame this in terms of good versus evil, which will offend uh, the sophisticates in academia. But uh, Israel is the good guys and Hamas is, is pure evil. And it's imperative that we, America, the leader of the free world, back the good guys to the hilt. And I use that um, phrase consciously in so much as it evokes kind of a medieval image of a of a sword thrust all the way in uh, to the hilt, uh, because we are going to have to support Israel as it systematically dismantles Hamas. And we can do this by ensuring that Israel's Iron Dome doesn't run out of ammo, as we usually supply about half of the rounds for Iron Dome. We can also provide precision munitions, such as small diameter bombs. Think the kind of bombs that could take out a townhouse without hurting the house next door. And from there, we have to ensure that uh, the War Reserve Stock Allies program that is established for Israel stays fully stocked. Uh, you know, put differently, Hugh, if Biden can offer unconditional support for Ukraine, surely his support for Israel, uh, in many ways a closer ally, should be just as, if not more, enthusiastic. You know, Congressman, some people I like a great deal. Guy Benson is my friend and mentee. John Pothorst I've known forever. They liked the president's speech yesterday. I did not, because he did not name Iran or Hezbollah. And if you don't name the evil... They think you're afraid of them. I mean, I just, I think Hamani must think Biden is afraid of him. Well, this administration, like the Obama administration before it, um, has based its entire Middle East policy on the idea of a nuclear deal with Iran. That's not just about the nuclear deal and its details, but really is about what former President Obama described as achieving a new equilibrium in the region. And the idea is that Iran could somehow balance against our traditional allies, Israel and the Sunni Arab Gulf states can become a more constructive regional actor. And in some ways, uh, we could have daylight between us and Israel to use Obama's disastrous phrase. Well, this this event, this this terrorist war that was launched against Israel, which, in my opinion, could not have happened without Iran's support, uh, even if they didn't direct the operational or tactical specifics, the fact is Hamas has benefited for years from Iranian money and Iranian weapons and Iranian training. This deal should put a stake in the heart of Biden's detente with Iran. Uh, and as hard as it is, the president needs to let go of the defibrillator and stop trying to resuscitate the lifeless corpse of Obama's nuclear deal with Iran. We need to return to a policy of maximum pressure on Iran, which is, of course, the only thing that unites. The reason we were seeing this historic rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia is because of the shared threat posed by Iran. And I think part of the reason we've seen this action taken by Hamas is because Iran wants to disrupt that rapprochement because it would be a threat to them. Um, probably our most practical and useful next step in this regard, if we want to get serious, is we can we can start by freezing the six billion dollar hostage payment to Iran that Biden did in return for five American hostages and to illustrate the absurdity, we now have at least 12 Americans taken hostage. So we've net lost seven Americans, which proves the eternal wisdom of not bribing terrorists. Uh, we can also freeze the 10 billion uh, based in Iraq that we allowed the Iraqis to pay for Iran, as well as fully enforce all sanctions. To me, that would be a practical, useful next step. And so I intend to call on the administration to freeze this money so that we don't provide more uh, weapons and materiel for evil terrorists like Hamas to kill Jews. Now, Congressman, I want to turn to the House conference. We're on the brink of war. We've got a carrier group, the Ford in the Mediterranean, a second carrier group headed to the Persian Gulf. Even though the president won't say it, we're on the brink of war. We don't have a functioning Congress because of eight members of the House GOP conference. Will we get there today? Because we it's like on December 6th, 1941, not having a House of Representatives, only knowing that the attack was coming. Will we get there today to a speaker? I'm cautiously optimistic. <clears throat> we are going to meet this morning to have the internal, you know, secret ballot vote for speaker. 
And traditionally, the person who gets the majority, even if you didn't vote for that person, then everyone, all Republicans are supposed to unite and support that speaker candidate on the floor. That's what I intend to do, uh, regardless of who I vote for, regardless who emerges victorious. And I sensed last night in our caucus meeting, and maybe this will prove to be sort of foolishly optimistic, that even those eight were reluctant to cause chaos on the floor again or do a version of what happened to Speaker McCarthy in January. In fact, you had some members of the eight saying explicitly that they would back whichever of the two candidates comes out of our internal vote. So that gives me some optimism. What we need to do is have the internal vote, go immediately to the floor, get a new speaker via a floor vote, and then take up a res- not only a resolution in support of Israel, which hopefully will be bipartisan, but an actual bill to ensure that our, our lethal support to Israel stays fully stocked and doesn't diminish in the recent days. Then we should turn to the business of rearming ourselves. If you said, we're not on the brink of war, we've seen, we, we now have two regional wars and we risk inviting a war in the Pacific in which we would be directly engaged if we continue on this delusionary path of disarmament, this utopian path of, of, of mi- underestimating the authoritarians, the genocidal godless authoritarians that we're dealing with in these countries. We increasingly have an axis of authoritarians arrayed against our interests. China is, of course, the dominant actor, but Putin is his junior partner, and the mullahs in Iran are part of this axis. And the goal is very simple. It's to destroy American leadership. It's to sever our traditional alliances and induce chaos on the world stage because the Iranians benefit from chaos, as does Russia, as does Xi Jinping. And so we need to wake up, and it's time for the West to rearm ourselves. Now, Chairman Gallagher, uh, the show is friends with both uh, Majority Leader Scalise and Chairman Jordan. I've had both men on. I've, I've known Jim for a long time. He's a Buckeye. Either one of them is fine by me. If there is a deadlock, what going to happen? Um, I guess we'd have another debate and, and subsequent rounds uh, of voting. I think it's highly unlikely that there would just be a pure deadlock. I think the whole thing will hinge, Hugh, on whether if the vote is narrow, if someone wins with a few votes here or there, is the other candidate willing to throw their support behind the other to ensure that their supporters don't try and drag this thing out over the course of multiple weeks? Um, I, I don't think either either Jim Jordan or Scalise is the type to do that. Uh, I do think they will work to unite the conference, regardless of whether they win or lose. Um, but that certainly is a possibility, Hugh. Uh, and again, as you said at the outset, we can't do anything until we have a new speaker. We're having this debate about, you know, whether Patrick McHenry is the speaker pro tem, has the power to do X, Y, and Z. But really, that's not what that position was intended to do. It's a caretaker position designed to facilitate the election of a new speaker and then the new speaker needs to get the House working uh, again. We have so many things critical to national security beyond just the money that we need to rearm ourselves, to rebuild our munitions industrial base. Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, is is up for renewal by the end of the year. We need to find a way to renew FISA while also reforming the process to get confidence that it won't be abused in the process. That's absolutely critical in terms of our national security. That's just one of many things we need to do, which we can't do because we don't have a speaker right now. Have you endorsed either candidate, Chairman Gallagher? I don't. I haven't followed this closely enough. I have not. And I, have not um, I asked. Uh, I asked some questions last night. Um, I, I have a few lingering questions. Really, my concerns are are are, are threefold. Let's say uh, most obviously, uh, as you know, Hugh. I, I think uh, you know we 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 have a war in Europe. We have a war in the Middle East. But a, a, a war in the Pacific, if deterrence collapses, would make those two regional wars. And, and potentially previous world wars look restrained in comparison. And so my mission is to uh, prevent World War III uh, without surrendering. Um, and I want to know what the candidates intend to do on the issue of China. We have critical China legislation right now that we need to pass that is stalled because of internal intra-committee jurisdictional fights. Um, we've done nothing to ban or force the sale of TikTok. We've done nothing to constrain outbound capital flows, American investments going to Chinese Militaries. We've done nothing to prevent uh, Chinese entities from buying land near military bases. Those are just the three low hanging fruit to say nothing of some of the harder things we need to do. That's my primary concern. Uh, I also want to ensure that if we go down the path of a long term CR, that we don't actually trigger the across the board uh, defense sequester, which could cut up to $50 billion for 
defense. This would be literal insanity because, of course, we experimented with this a decade ago and it was disastrous for for defense. And then I think that's bound up in a third thing, which is the overall dysfunction of our budget and appropriations process. We've had numerous super committees, outside commissions analyze this dating back to the Dreyer Commission in 1993. More recently, Congressman Womack led an effort in 2018. We, we, we continually recognize we have an unsustainable problem in terms of our broken appropriation process. We have multiple proposals for how to fix it. What we lack is the will and the leadership to do it. And ultimately, it's going to take a speaker, a speaker to do it. And the final point on this, you and I'm sorry to go on, is that in my opinion, and I voiced this to the conference two nights ago, now is precisely the time to do it because we have a narrow majority and divided government. We aren't going to be able to advance an ambitious policy agenda. So there's never a better time to turn to the plumbing of Congress, the process fixes that are policy agnostic. That may be more boring. It may be less sexy than some of the big policy wins. But that's precisely what led to what we saw last week, which is the deposal of the speaker for the first time in history, because the process is so dysfunctional. Members feel no loyalty to the institution and they seek power outside of the institution, outside of their committee work. They channel their energy and ambition into media appearances because we've turned Congress into nothing more than a green room for Fox News or MSNBC. Please remind your colleagues that that 1,200 Israelis are dead and we are at war and they cannot be children. Uh, they just cannot be children. They cannot be posing. I, I, I know you want any luck with Matt Gates, but the other seven, good luck with them. Uh, Chairman Mike Gallagher, uh, I appreciate it. Good luck today. We need a speaker. We got to get one today and we got to get serious in a hurry. Chairman Gallagher, one of the serious people. Thank you.